Hello, everyone, and welcome to this third day of our summer seminar on the classical liberal tradition. We are joined again by Professor Steve Davies, who is delivering his second of three lectures for the seminar. And the title of this lecture is Liberalism and the Challenge of Politics. Professor Davies. Thank you. Well, uh, good to be here again. Uh, I can tell you that the rain is still falling here in Manchester with no sign of letting up. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, the usual kind of state of affairs around here. What I want to talk about in this lecture uh, is not what you might call the challenge of practical politics, but rather uh, the challenge to liberals of the whole idea of political decision making as being something that should decide how large areas of life are organized. And I want to, by doing this, say something about the kind of challenges that uh, liberals face in talking to other people, uh, the kind of conversation that they're regularly having with their interlocutors, basically, uh, and to make them make you realize, perhaps, if you don't realize already, uh, the degree to which there's a fundamental disagreement between uh, classical liberals, certainly, and most of their interlocutors, including revisionist liberals, uh, and the root of that disagreement is, in fact, the whole question of just how important or extensive politics should be. Now, the talk I'm going to give here is in some sense a riff on, or it jumps off from a book written by the lady whose uh, picture you can see here, Sherry Berman, uh, teaches at Columbia University, uh, author of a number of books, uh, and in particular, the book here, uh, The Primacy of Politics, uh, which is essentially a historical account, an intellectual history, of the origins and development of social democracy, particularly Swedish social democracy, although she looks a lot at German social democracy as well. But that is framed by a wider kind of analysis that Berman puts forward uh, of what is going on in European intellectual life more generally in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, and I think that this is profoundly insightful. I think this is an extremely good book. Uh, and what I'm going to do, if you like, is take that starting point, but uh, go on from it uh, and try to say something more general, perhaps, because the book is rather specific. So the starting point, really, is a theoretical question, which is a very important one in political philosophy. And that is to do with the kinds of order that exist in the world. And, of course, as I'm sure you've been told by a number of other people, in all kinds of areas of life, there are two kinds of order that we can observe uh, and see. Uh, one of them is a spontaneous or emergent order. Now, a spontaneous or emergent order, to reiterate a well-worn point, is one where the order, the pattern, the structure, the predictability, uh, emerges from the individual choices made by specific human beings uh, and also voluntarily formed collections of human beings within an institutional framework, a framework of rules. So what you get is an orderly patterned outcome uh, which is undesigned. It arises from uh, the individual choices made uh, in interactions between different human beings or groups of human beings. And these choices are then aggregated through a process of some kind. The process may be a market process, but it can be other kinds of social process. Uh, sociologically, this is what uh, Fabio Rojas, for example, another person who's lectured at these seminars, means by saying that freedom is something that we, is done by people together. It's that process of interaction uh, that constitutes freedom and which generates order in this way. Uh, now, the other kind of order, of course, uh, is something that is consciously chosen and determined. Not exactly planned. Uh, planned order is more a specific kind of order of this sort. It's one where the order that we see arises out of the conscious determination or plan uh, by, or action, I should say, decision made by a chooser. Uh, now, what that chooser is, of course, uh, can vary. Uh, now, the second one, this second kind of order, uh, is, as it says here, one where the political process, the process of uh, collective political choice, shapes the outcome, or at the very least, trumps and overrides emergent order. So, in other words, in the second kind of order, it may be that the order is created almost from scratch through the political process by conscious and deliberate choice, or it may be that you have an existent emergent order, but the 
product of that emergent order is then trumped, it's overridden, uh, overruled by the decisions arrived at through the political process. Now, of course, the political process can take any one of a number of forms. And if you like, the two extremes, the two poles of the political process are pure absolute monarchy, autocracy, uh, of the kind you had, say, in Old Kingdom Egypt, maybe Tsarist Russia or the Inca Empire, where you have a single ruler and basically whatever he says is what happens. Uh, and therefore you have just one person uh, that makes all of the choices, makes the deliberate conscious choices and thereby creates an order. In that sense, the political process is entirely one that takes place within the head of the choosing autocrat. Uh, at the other extreme of the spectrum uh, is deliberative consensus, uh, a kind of discursive democracy based upon deliberation, like, say, ancient Athens, but also one where there's a rule of unanimity, like the old Polish parliament, uh, where you have to have uh, everybody's buy-in for anything binding to be decided. Now, those, of course, those two are the two extreme outliers, but it's important to realise that in one sense, they are both examples of the same phenomenon, uh, which is of a political process that arrives at uh, choices about how things should be uh, through a deliberative or collective choice mechanism, rather than through the emergent mechanism uh, by which independent and unknowing, mutually unknowing, that is, choices made by individuals or groups are aggregated by some kind of impersonal process. The reality of actual political orders, of course, is that they fall somewhere between those two extremes uh, that I've described. Uh, and generally, in the last uh, couple of hundred years, political orders in many parts of the world have tended to migrate more towards the deliberative consensus end, but they're still a long way away from it. Uh, so there's a big division about which of these two kinds of orders you should have. Uh, now, it's important to realise this point that I got at the start here. The real division in political philosophy and between different kinds of political movements is not about the size of government. There tends to be, amongst uh, libertarians and classical liberals in particular, a fixation on measurements of the size of government. The most commonly used one is the share of GDP taken by taxation and government spending. Uh, and so people generally try to distinguish between different regimes, different real world political orders, uh, by that metric, by the proportion of GDP uh, consumed by state activity in a particular country political entity. But actually, that's a relatively, uh, that's a less important metric than the other one I've got here, the scope of government, or actually, to be more precise, the scope of the political decision-making process, as opposed to the uh, dispersed private decision-making process. The question, in other words, is how many areas of life and which areas of life should be subject to the political way of making decisions and the political order? In other words, how much of what we do, how much of our existence should be subject to conscious choices made through a collective decision making process, the political process, and how much of our life should be rather subject to the spontaneous order uh, that arises out of things like market exchange or all kinds of other uh, social exchange. Uh, and then coming on from this is the question I've already alluded to. Uh, what are the circumstances, if any, in which political decisions, decisions arrived at through the political process should override the emergent order process? Now, the reason why I made that point at the start there is that it's perfectly possible to have a government that has extensive scope. Uh, it is responsible for or makes decisions about a large area of life, but which is actually of small size because it doesn't spend a lot of money. Uh, so if you look, for example, at the British state in 1900, it was only spending about 10% of GDP, but it made decisions about a lot of things. It's just that the things that it made decisions about didn't involve it spending a lot of money, or mainly because they didn't involve it employing a lot of people. What has happened in the course of the 20th century uh, is not so much the government has become bigger or that its scope has extended, although there has been a great deal of that, it's rather that government action, 
the political process has expanded into areas where the result has been employing a lot of people and therefore spending large amounts of money. Uh, and so you can have a very powerful, very extensive government that's relatively small in terms of the GDP that it consumes. Uh, now, it's worth saying also, before we move on, that the story of the growth of the scope of politics in modern times is not a unidirectional one. It's very easy to fall into the trap of thinking that because the size of government has generally expanded in most countries, therefore the scope of politics has also increased in a unidirectional way as well. So that basically the trend is always for more and more areas of life to be subject to political decision making. But actually that's not true. If you look at the last 200 years, uh, it goes in both directions. There have been large areas where uh, the political decision making process has indeed taken over uh, or had come to have a large part to play in areas that were previously entirely the domain of private choice, education for example, but there have also equally been areas which were profoundly political say 200 years ago or even 100 years ago in many places but which are now almost entirely private. The obvious one would be religious life uh, but that is also true of a whole range of things that you would not even think of as having a political uh, implication these days, such as, for example, uh, clothing and the kind of dress that people wear, which was indeed very much a political matter at one point. Uh, a kind of a side here, this is not part of the main argument, it's a point worth making here. The family is always a domain of collective choice. Within a family, we do not use market mechanisms uh, to decide how things are done uh, and how the family should organize its life, how the household should organize its life. It's also always a domain of internal power relations. Within the family or the household, there is always ultimately somebody who is the boss, basically, uh, at least if it's going to be functional at all. Uh, I think that you could say that a household where that isn't the case is one that is, uh, barely deserves a name. Now, obviously, as has been often pointed out, families and households are a check on larger forms of public power, uh, and particularly government. But they're also in tension with pure individualism, uh, pure personal choice and self-determination. So liberals have always been ambivalent about the power of families. On the one hand, they recognize their importance, both for human existence and flourishing, and also as a check on uh, politics in the wider sense, but at the same time, liberals have historically always been aware of the potential of families, uh, tightly knit families in particular, you might say, to actually restrain and restrict self-realization and individual development. And it's worth saying the point that I make at the end here, which is the historical one, that until really quite recently, more recently than you might imagine, uh, government was household based. Uh, you don't really get a movement away from household-based government in a fundamental systematic way until the very end of the 18th or start of the 19th century I would argue and also until very recently as recently as the 1900s or even the 1920s society was conceived of not as being composed of individuals but as being composed uh, of a nested federation of households and in the chronological sense lineage so that's a kind of side effect to this because uh, if you are talking about the contrast I'm making between emergent spontaneous order and deliberate political order, one of the questions that obviously comes up in that context is how the family and the household fit into this. And the answer is in a complicated way. Families, as always, being complicated. Now, here's the starting point for the discussion that I'm going to uh, so go into launching off Sherry Berman's book. And that is the distinctiveness of liberalism. Now, in most political philosophies and theories, ways of thinking about society and politics, they start with the assumption that there's a public sphere governed by political choice, because that is what politics is about, after all. So most political theories are start with the assumption that there is a part of life that is governed by politics, uh, and then uh, go on to argue about how that should be organised, who has the legitimate right to take part in that political decision-making process, what rules, of any, should govern it, what kind of outcomes you want to achieve. But the starting assumption is that there's a large area of life which is governed by this. What you then do as a secondary uh, argument is to say, well, okay, where, when does it stop? In other words, 
The assumption is, well, there's an area of life which is governed by politics. How would we define the area of life that is not governed by politics? So you start off uh, with, if you like, the political assumption, and you then go on from that, having also had all these secondary arguments that I mentioned, to define uh, by exclusion an area of life where politics does not apply. But it's the political sphere of life that is the starting point, and if you like, the default. It's worth saying, by the way, that nobody, unless you count maybe Pol Pot uh, or the Kim Jong-un, uh, thinks that you should have a state that does everything. So the idea that uh, you're in favour of limited government, in a way, uh, is an OTO statement, because nobody, apart from those couple of extreme cases, is in favour of unlimited government. Uh, the argument is always about exactly how big the sphere of non-governmental activity should be, uh, not whether the government should do absolutely everything. Uh, and so that's the kind of basic approach. Now, liberalism, by contrast, um, has a different approach. It starts from the other end. The starting point, as it says here, is individuality and the choices made by individuals and the private sphere. And so that is taken as the default position. And the argument then is, well, what is the area of life where this process is not appropriate for some reason, uh, and you have to have politics. So instead of assuming that politics is the default position, and you then work out what areas of life politics does not apply to, from the liberal starting point, you start off with the assumption that the default position is non-political decision making and the sphere of life that is not governed by politics and what you then do having started from that point is to work out what in this case the exception is the exception being the area of life that is governed by politics and so this makes liberalism as a way of looking at the world quite different from many of the other or most of the other uh, ways of thinking that we we can find and come across historically but, and this is an important point, and this is the point that Cherry Burton makes very eloquently in the first part of her book, liberalism is not alone in this. There's actually a surprising similarity in this regard between classical liberalism and classical Marxism. And this, the answer is this, both classical liberalism and classical Marxism look forward to a world without politics. Uh, and I've got the names of some of the people in whose writings you can see this most clearly. So if you read the writings of the uh, 19th century classical, radical classical liberal Herbert Spencer, Spencer thinks that society is evolving towards a state of affairs where politics, uh, militant societies he calls it, the collective or deliberate decision-making process will become minimal or even disappear. You will live instead in a world of contracts and private choice and private interaction where there will not be collective decision-making processes, much less uh, one individual or very small group of individuals making decisions for everybody else. But you also find this in Marx and Engels and also the people I've mentioned there, people like August Babel, leader of German social democracy, Plekhanov, the founder of Marxism uh, in Russia, and perhaps most notably, Karl Kautsky, the theoretician for many years of the German social democrats. And what Kautsky argues is that uh, basically, first of all, you don't really need politics to arrive at socialism, because uh, according to Marxism, the socialist world is coming going to come about with the inevitability of a law of nature because of the way in which capitalism will develop and its internal contradictions but not only that kautsky and the other classical marxists also argue that once you have moved into socialism there will no longer be politics there will merely be administration there won't be a collective decision making process of the kind that you have at the moment so both uh, cla radical classical liberals like Spencer and the mainstream of classical orthodox Marxism uh, take the view that we're moving towards a world where we won't have politics. And also, crucially, this is seen in both cases as being a good thing. Now, what they disagree about, of course, uh, is, the, is what that world of that politics is going to be like. 
uh, for Spencer, it's a world of radical individualism, and it's a world essentially where the economies are going to be organized uh, in a way where almost everyone is self-employed. Uh, quite a different vision of what the economy is like uh, in the classical Marxism of Marx and his immediate followers. Uh, for them, as I says here, the idea of this future world of that politics is that it comes from Marx's rather Rousseau-esque vision, the kind of vision you get in the writings of the younger Marx, of a world where alienated labor no longer exists. Uh, that's his big objection to capitalism, of course. It's that it alienates people from the product of their work, which he, and work, he thinks, is an essential part of human life. Uh, and so therefore it alienates us from what he calls our species being, our nature as human beings. And so he looks forward to a world in which uh, that alienation no longer exists, and there's therefore no division between individuality and collective life. Uh, so it's a rather different vision from the radical individualism of, say, Spencer. Uh, but, as I say, there's still the underlying idea that in both cases you won't have politics anymore. Now, the other big point of agreement, apart from the agreement that we're moving towards a world without politics, is about the way we will get there. Because both of them believe that we're going to get there through a process of historical evolution. In other words, that there's a kind of teleological process going on in history which will lead us to this world without politics. Uh, for Spencer, it's the gradual growth of interconnectivity uh, and the growth of commercial relations as opposed to what he calls military relations. For Marx and Engels and their followers, it's the gradual evolution of the material of productive forces and the intensification of the contradictions of capitalism. But both of these schools of thought think that there's a kind of automatic or autonomous historical process which will lead to these outcomes independent of the will of human beings acting at the time. Uh, human beings, in other words, are in some sense, uh, even though the process is formed of the actions that they take, they are led in a way to uh, bring about a historical outcome by a process that is again emergent. Uh, it's not nothing that anyone has consciously or deliberately chosen. So history is seen as being an emergent process for both of them. And the world that they both look forward to, the world of that politics, is one that is going to emerge out of that process, a dialectical one for Marx, slightly different one for people like Spencer. Now, in the later 19th century, there's a kind of increasing feeling of dissatisfaction with both of these ideologies. Uh, and there's a kind of hostile response to both of them. Uh, this is led by a number of very different people and takes, obviously, a number of different forms. Uh, what this involves is a reassertion of the importance and ultimate primacy of politics. In other words, the people who react against both classical liberalism and classical Marxism both reject the determinism the automaticity of the historical process that both ideologies subscribe to, and they reassert instead the idea that conscious deliberative choice, collective choice, uh, is hugely important, is not going to weigh, and above all, that it is primary, that political choice, deliberate conscious collective choice, should override spontaneous emergent outcomes. Uh, it's held to have a higher level of validity in some way, uh, and therefore to have a higher value, a greater importance. And so what you get, therefore, is an assertion, as it says here, of the importance of deliberate choice. Now, as I said, this comes in a wide number of variants. Uh, so you have three broad types of political theory that, or political movement actually, which are based upon this principle of the primacy of politics, the reassertion of the importance of the deliberate political collective choice as opposed to the spontaneous emergent choice. And as I say, three broad families here. The first is ones that are democratic. So this includes the one that is the subject of Berman's book, Social Democracy, founded by people like Edward Bernstein, the Fabians in Britain, a number of other important thinkers that she looks at. 
but there's others that she doesn't spend so much attention to, but which also fit very much into the story she tells. Christian democracy, for example, hugely important political movement uh, in the continent of Europe, uh, arising really with the series of great encyclicals that Pope Leo uh, put forward in the 1890s, things like Rerum Novarum. Democratic conservatism, uh, a popular conservatism of the kind that you can see emerging in the last part of the 19th century in Great Britain, but also elsewhere in the world. Uh, also so-called new liberalism, the liberalism of people like uh, Leonard Hobhouse, uh, J.A. Hobson, later on John Maynard Keynes, the kind of liberalism that has become uh, really the dominant kind of liberalism in the course of the 20th century. Uh, all of these have uh, interesting overlaps but also interesting uh, divisions between them, but they all share a view that democratic politics uh, is the thing that should trump spontaneous and emergent outcomes and should have a primary value. Then you also get uh, revolutionary forms of the primacy of politics, uh, arguments that the process that should uh, override spontaneous order should not be uh, necessarily deliberative democracy or representative democracy, but should be some kind of revolutionary act of will. Uh, this exists in the form, say, of fascism. Uh, Leninism, uh, one of the important things to realize is how radically Lenin challenges orthodox Marxism, as well as the way in which Bernstein challenges it. Also authoritarian nationalism of a common type in the 20th century, and also anarchism. Now you may say, well, wait a minute, how is an anarchist asserting the primacy of politics? Well, it's because most of the anarchists who appear at the end of the 19th century, and particularly revolutionary communist anarchists, believe in revolutionary politics. They believe in the idea that the new world they want to see, the new order they want to bring about, should be brought about through a conscious political process, uh, a process of overthrowing and destroying the existing order. Uh, and they still think in the future that there will be a kind of politics. Uh, they typically want to move things towards uh, one of the extremes I mentioned earlier, the extreme of complete consensual uh, democracy, in fact, uh, one where you know, any one person can veto a collective decision. But the point is, again, they are people who believe that the political process is, is and should be a central part of changing the world in which we live and moving to another one. So you have democratic and revolutionary forms uh, of this assertion of the primacy of politics. One of the things Berman does, very skillfully by the way, uh, is to draw out the overlaps and similarities between some of the revolutionary forms and the democratic forms. So there are striking similarities which she paint, draws out very clearly between fascism and social democracy. Uh, she doesn't talk about Christian democracy, but you could have made that argument with equal force, if not more, for fascism and Christian democracy or democratic conservatism. Uh, there's also obvious affinities between uh, social democracy and Leninism in some ways, or Christian democracy and authoritarian nationalism. And then there's a third family, which is what you might call the technocratic form of the primacy of politics. Now, she doesn't discuss this at all, but I would argue this is actually one of the most important forms, particularly in the contemporary world. Uh, it takes expression, for example, in certain aspects of American progressivism, uh, notably in the work of uh, people like Woodrow Wilson. Uh, and the technocratic idea is the idea that the political process should indeed uh, trump spontaneous order processes, but that political process should be neither democratic nor revolutionary. Rather, it should be the rule of dispassionate experts uh, informed by modern social science. Now, not a new idea in many ways. You can even trace this as far back as people like the Marquis de Condorcet at the time of the French Revolution, but it's an idea which gets a huge new lease of life uh, at the same time that we see this other, these other aspects of the revival of politics. And it's gone on to become, I would argue, in fact, perhaps one of the most influential ways of thinking about politics uh, in the course of the 20th century. Now, how do these fit in with classical liberalism? And the answer is differently. So the democratic variants accept most of the liberal revolution of the uh, period up to 1870. So things like social democracy, Christian democracy, uh, democratic conservatism, the like, uh, do not want to move forward to a 
non-liberal or anti-liberal kind of political order. They actually accept many of the achievements of the classical liberal era of the central decades of the 19th century, such as the separation of church and state, uh, the privatization of religion, in other words, uh, the abolition of censorship, the establishment of representative institutions, uh, the abolition of a whole range of hereditary privileges and the like. Uh, they don't want even the democratic conservatives to undo that liberal revolution. Uh, they simply want to run what was already by then a broadly liberal uh, society with politics having a large part or place to play. So they're compatible with liberalism to some degree. On the other hand, they're not fully compatible with it because they assert politics in a way that is not the case with classical liberal thinkers, such as uh, Mill, even though Mill writes a lot about representative government, he still ultimately is coming from a position where politics is thought of as being the kind of residual area of life that isn't governed by personal choice uh, and all the other kind of things he's talking about, like experiments in living. Uh, whereas for these people, although they accept many liberal institutions and achievements, they still think that political choice ultimately is what should call the shots. Now with the revolutionary variants, it's clearly not compatible. The revolutionary variants of this process are the kind of, some of the kind of movements I was talking about in my previous lecture. Uh, these are movements that advocate typically a different version of modernity to the liberal one. Uh, they're movements, like some earlier ones, uh, which are advocating a radical break with the liberal achievements of the 19th century and a move to a non-liberal kind of world, as well as a reassertion of politics. So there's obviously a profound division between uh, liberalism of any kind uh, and the revolutionary variants of the primacy of politics. The big question, which uh, we, we, I want to put to you, which liberals I think really need to think about much, much more seriously, is whether or not the third version is compatible. Uh, and I think that what we have to deal with here is what you might call the liberal temptation, but more about that in a moment. Uh, there are too many people, I think, who think that that third version is also compatible with liberalism uh, to some degree in the way that the first one is. I would personally disagree strongly with that. I think it's as incompatible as the second, albeit in a different way. So this is the challenge that I want to conclude with, the challenge for classical liberals. Questions I think that classical liberals need to think about. Given that we're living in a world where the primacy of politics has been reasserted, where people do generally think that political decisions should have priority uh, and should have a higher value status and power than spontaneously emerging outcomes. Given that, what is the nature of the conversations that liberals who reject that idea and who make private choice and aggregated private choice the default, what is the nature of the conversation that they're having? So what do you do? Do you simply reassert uh, and continue the support for spontaneous order? That, I think, is the kind of pure classical liberal position now. Uh, you reassert the idea that politics should be a kind of residual area of life. If you're really radical, of course, you will take the view, as the young Herbert Spencer did, that it can be ignored entirely or that it will even disappear. I think that what you have to do, though, is to abandon the teleological determinist elements uh, of uh, 19th century classical liberal thought. The idea that there is some kind of uh, structural process in history which is moving human society through a number of observable stages and which will culminate in the apolitical liberal utopia. I think that that kind of deterministic view of history has not survived or cannot survive the experience of the 20th century. And so the question is, do you reassert, do you reassert the kind of vision that Spencer, for example, had, but leave out the kind of uh, teleological element? That, however, then poses the question of, if you've taken out the automaticity, how do you get there? How do you turn that philosophical uh, assertion that politics is not primary into an actual political program or an actual program of action that will 
have an effect upon the society around you. Maybe not a political program, strictly speaking. That's a big challenge, and it's a challenge that liberals need to face. If you reject the primacy of politics, you, the obvious question is then, well, what will you do? And if you can no longer exert a determinist model of historical change, you then have to come up with a theory of social and collective action uh, that will do the kinds of things that politics uh, is appealed to now, to solve now. Also, it's important to realize who and what are you arguing against if you are a classical liberal? It's very easy to think that the main, your main opponent, if you will, the person you're arguing against, are the revolutionaries, the fascists, the socialists, the communists, uh, the extreme uh, reactionaries. But actually, in many ways, your most important interlocutor, the person you really have to argue against and ultimately persuade, uh, are the democratic uh, people, the people who ultimately assert the superiority of collective choice over emergent order, but argue that that collective choice should be democratic and rule bound. How do you argue against them? What is the basis on which you say that they're incorrect in their arguments and presuppositions? Because that is what a reassertion of the classical liberal idea of a world without politics would mean. And finally, that's the third option. And this is what I mean by the temptation, the liberal temptation. The great temptation of the classical liberals, particularly in the last 30 to 40 years, has been to think that the way to bring about a free society, the way to roll back politics, not government, uh, is to rely upon technocratic experts to rely upon a kind of politics that is driven by uh, expert economists, people trained maybe at, oh, dare I say, Chicago, uh, who can then uh, inaugurate through a series of institutional reforms a kind of process which will depoliticize large areas of life. There's something fundamentally contradictory in this because it involves using what is a quintessentially political mechanism, the rule essentially in this case of a scientific oligarchy, to declare that certain areas of human life will no longer be subject to politics. What it actually does though is to move politics away from a democratic model to a model of technocratic elitism. Uh, and that is not actually a gain if you're a liberal of the classical kind who believes rather that society should be organized to the maximum extent possible by spontaneous order. And so that is actually an extremely dangerous route to go down. It's also, I think, in all of the evidence that we have, one that is bad, even in terms of the political process itself, because it's increasingly arousing uh, vehement uh, and in my view, well-justified opposition. Uh, and to the extent that liberals of all kinds tie themselves to the chariot of technocratic expert governance, I think they're doing themselves to political defeat and irrelevance, uh, given that we are living in a world where politics is still primary. So at that point, I'll stop. Professor Davies, the first question. In practical terms, what is a classical liberal response, or maybe better yet, what are some classical liberal responses to politics as we know it today with parties and legislatures and courts and all the trappings of modern political life? Well, uh, the there are two responses really. The first is to make the general theoretical case that uh, you want to do things less by collective decision making and more by individual uh, choice. In other words, to reassert that fundamental value. The other thing uh, is actual activism. In other words, trying to do things through voluntary action of various kinds, either at an individual level or through voluntary collective action. Uh, the two things obviously going together because truly individual action actually is not practical. That was you know, Fabio's point, which I alluded to in my answer. So that's what the thing to do. On the one hand, keep making the uh, principled argument that collective decision making that binds everyone is hugely problematic in most areas of life. And secondly, to actually walk the walk. Uh, don't just talk, talk, walk the walk as well. Go out there and do things uh, in your own locality, in your own life with other people uh, that can change the world.
your point about constraining everyone to the same uh, set of rules or decisions echoes something that we heard from Jacob Levy yesterday. So for those who want right. to hear uh, more about that sort of argument from a classical liberal perspective, I would refer them to his lecture yesterday. So uh, if you could say more about the teleological view of history, how does it relate to someone like Hegel and uh, why should we abandon it? Yeah, um, two things to say about that. Uh, one is, where, where does Hegel come into all this? The answer is he's hugely important, of course. Uh, he's a major theorist of the teleological conception of history. Uh, that's where Marx gets his ideas from, of course, uh, although he inverts it by making it material forces rather than ideas that are the driving force. But of course, it predates Hegel by a long way. So Adam Smith has a teleological vision of history, which he in turn gets from the Scottish historian William Robertson. Uh, and ultimately, I think the whole idea of a teleological structure to history goes all the way back to St. Augustine and the city of God. That, that's the real place where it comes from. Uh, the other question which I saw about that is the question of must uh, classical liberals give up on the teleological idea of history? Uh, can they be... Uh, and must they be um, in methodological individualists? So my answer is, well, they need to give up on the teleological um, bit, model of history. That's my argument, that they should not have it, because I think the historical evidence doesn't support it. I just don't think there is the empirical work of history shows that there is such a thing as a teleological pattern or structure to the course of history, which is why smart revisionist Marxists have abandoned it, uh, even though it's the core of Marx's own thought in many ways. Uh, and so uh, does that mean that you have to be a methodological individualist? Not necessarily. I think that's two separate issues. It's perfectly possible to have a non-teleological vision of history and be a methodological holist or to be a methodological individualist. It, that's, that's a separate issue, I think. Okay. So let's talk concrete examples for a second. Can you give some examples outside of the market where a classical liberal might prefer emergent politics to deliberative or collective politics? Uh, well, for example, uh, things like lifestyles. Uh, do we, at the moment, we have a major push to extend the political decision-making process into lifestyle choices of various kinds. Things like uh, diet, uh, but also ways of living. Uh, there's been historically there were many efforts to regulate people's sexual conduct uh, through the political process. Uh, those are both areas which are not market related. Uh, you know, definitely, the classical liberal would support a spontaneous order rather than a deliberative political process. Okay. Is deliberative politics itself? in some ways emergent. So think of a, a group of citizens deliberating about an issue. They're drawing on their local knowledge of the problem and so on. Doesn't that qualify as being emergent in, in some sense? Might there be some sort of uh, false dichotomy here in some situations? Uh, yes, the answer is up to a point, yes. Because what I think, uh, you have going on there is an emergent process of the formation of what you might call a movement. But as soon as that movement, that social movement, becomes primarily involved in the process of trying to win elections, gain power, uh, use the political decision-making process to uh, arrive at decisions governing collective life, then it ceased to be an emergent process. So you could say that the emergence of a movement is a, 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 an emergent process. But once that movement gets involved in politics, it ceased to be part of that, even if the goal of the politics is to roll politics back, if you take my meaning. How does conservatism fit into the schema that you've offered here? Well, the, and that's very interesting. It depends on the historical context. If conservatives are confident that the uh, emergent press is going to preserve the things that they like because conservatism is ultimately all about, as the name suggests, conserving and preserving a particular established and settled way of life and way of doing things. So if you're a conservative and you are confident that the non-political emergent process is going to uh, preserve your 
way of doing things, uh, then you'll tend to favour it and you will be hostile to politics. If, on the other hand, you think that the emergent process is undermining uh, the kind of things you value, then you're not going to favour it. So um, with conservatives, it's a contingent matter depending upon specific historical circumstances, their own view of where they stand in those circumstances that determines whether they favour political processes or not. A couple other questions about uh, the, the schema that you've introduced. So Jason Brennan's book, Against Democracy, makes an argument for considering epistocracy or rule by the knowing, rule by uh, the, the wise. So how yeah. does that fit into your schema? It's something that, that I think a lot of um, folks who are inclined toward classical liberalism find attractive. A lot of folks have uh, strong disagreements with it for uh, its skepticism of democracy. What are your thoughts? Uh, count me in as one of the strong disagreement people, uh, actually, but not because of Jay, Jay's hostility to democracy, which I, I broadly share. Um, his argument essentially is that the political decision-making process should rest upon what he calls the Vulcans, uh, the people who are genuinely A, well-informed and B, dispassionate. Uh, now, um, I, the reason why I object to that is not because it's undemocratic, but because I think it overestimates the degree to which the Vulcans actually know what they think they know uh, and are aware of what they don't know. In other words, it's, I have a Hayekian objection to Jay's uh, model, basically, uh, which is that the fundamental problem for the political way of deciding things is the knowledge problem, the lack of knowledge about what world is and what is going on in it, uh, which is necessarily going to derail most conscious and deliberative decision-making processes. And it seems to me that the real danger of having uh, government by Vulcans, the epistocracy, is that they will be amazingly conceited and hugely overestimate how much they know uh, and what the degree and extent of their ignorance is. Uh, and so actually I would rather rely upon uh, as a you know, least bad option, uh, the kind of decision making of the hobbits, as he calls them, uh, you know, the kind of ignorant, not very engaged and basically ill-informed people. And I would try to rely as far as I can on wisdom of crowd effects. Uh, better, of course, not to have, uh, you know, such an extensive role for politics in the first place. So although I share Jay's negative critique of um, you know, the way democracy is valorized and currently talked about. I don't share his belief in epistocracy. I think that's a complete blind alley. Okay, and we have time for one last question. Again, uh, similar lines. How would you classify regimes that have high levels of judicial review and court engagement? Do those fit into democratic um, sorts of regime types? Uh, I have, that's a very good question. I think the answer is, at the moment, regimes of that kind are highly technocratic and expert driven. Uh, it depends on what courts see their role as being and actually have their role as being. Now, if uh, the courts are operating in the kind of legal regime that Jean Hasnas, who I see you've got coming up, is advocating, it's a pure common law regime uh, with no real principle of stare decisis, uh, then the judges would basically be subjecting uh, actions of power or indeed of individuals to the emergent norms identified by the common law discovery process. Uh, now in that case, I would be fine with it because the judicial review, if you will, or judicial action and judgment would be part of a spontaneous process itself to the extent that the common law is a spontaneous emergent process. However, that's not the world we live in. Even in nominally common law orders, as John constantly argues, because of the way that the principle of stare decisis has come to be understood, we no longer live in that kind of purely emergent common law order. And of course, statute law is now enormously important. Plus, in the contemporary world, uh, judicial elites, judges, senior lawyers and counsel and the like, see their role quite explicitly as being to understand and promulgate a kind of higher order of wisdom against the emergent order that arises out of what the ignorant people do. And so I think that the 
current system of judicial review, judicial oversight is intensely and deeply technocratic. And in fact, if you are a Democrat, uh, it's, it's something you should strongly object to. However, the problem for liberals is at the moment that a lot of the opposition to uh, this technocratic judicial review comes from political populists, not naming any names, but I'm sure we can all think of plenty, uh, whose alternative is to have straightforward majoritarian democracy where a popular majority acting through the political process can impose its will on everybody else, which is, if anything, even worse. Uh, so what liberals actually want is something else, which is a legal system, uh, which will itself be an emergent process and will reflect a spontaneous uh, development of norms in society. There are obviously limits to that, uh, which, you know, I'm sure Jacob will be talking about one of his talks, but that's the, that, that's where I would stand on this. So at the moment, very much technocratic.